Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining our webinar, Looking for a Sustainable Option to Attract, Grow, and Retain Talent. And we're going to talk about the example of Switzerland. We have assembled a power panel of international expansion experts to give you some insights and demystify the complexities usually related to global expansion. My name is Marjorie Hamlin, and I will be the moderator for today's panel. I represent the Swiss Economic Promotion Agency called the Greater Geneva Bern Area, and I am based in Silicon Valley in California. In a nutshell, our organization facilitates market access to Western Switzerland and helps entrepreneurs connect with R&D institutions, possible partners, and establish an entity. The services of the GGBA are entirely free of charge, they're confidential, and they're tailored to the needs of each company. And very often, we hear the need for hiring great talent. And today, we would like to address this topic and share useful information. So a little bit of housekeeping, I would like to let you know that we are recording this webinar and you will be getting a link after uh, the session is over. Please also note that you can ask questions in the chat. Now, our panelists include ladies first, Monica Cohen Dumani, partner and international tax services lead, EMEA with PwC, joining us from Geneva. JB Olagne, client engagement director with Michael Page Group, joining us from Geneva also. And Derek Hayden, president of Machere USA, joining us from Switzerland alongside the lake, also the lake of Geneva. So thank you all for spending time with us and let's dive right in. So we're here today to help answer some of the questions you CEOs and entrepreneurs ask when contemplating going global. You wanna open up the talent pool. You know there are great talents, for instance, in Europe, but where do you start the process and what tools do you need? It can be overwhelming and you don't have the bandwidth to tackle this topic. So we're going to provide you with helpful information and tips about hiring talent, starting a business, and corporate aspects related to that. We will also hear from Derek and his experience having moved his company from Los Angeles to Switzerland and creating a subsidiary in the canton of Vaux. <clears throat> You're faced with many options when you pick a location in Europe, and it's, it can be intimidating. So hopefully you come away from this webinar today with actionable elements. And we're gonna focus on Switzerland. Why Switzerland? To set the stage, we just got some numbers this week that foreign trade between the US and Switzerland is booming. And I'll share three numbers. One, the US became Switzerland's top export market last year, displacing Germany as the most important export market for the first time in 70 years. Number two, in terms of import to Switzerland, the US comes in third place. And number three, two years ago, and I don't have the latest number for, for, for last year or, or, or 2020, but in 2019, Switzerland was the sixth largest foreign investor in the US. And that represented about 200, I mean, about $300 billion. So Switzerland is a key partner of the US. And we believe that you can you know, consider your options in Switzerland, find talent there. So my first question is gonna be about finding talent. However, Switzerland is not a large country, right? By any means, 8 million people. So how attractive is it when we hear about shortage of talent everywhere, right? Who wants to pick that question? Well, happy to start uh, if you want um, on this one. Um, well, I, I would say first, uh, Marjorie, that um, the talent shortage is also um, uh, is also something we experience in Switzerland. I mean, it's it's not an, uh, an island where, where where we don't have such a such talent shortage. So this is uh, also a, a given fact, but. but um, I think we are um, uh, good assets to uh, to cope with it, um, and, and I would like to uh, mention perhaps two um, two aspects of it. The first one is uh, linked to the local talent pool, um, and I think that the existing Swiss workforce is generally well educated. Um, they, they are uh, usually. Uh, 
uh, quite experienced uh, with uh, multinationals. Uh, they they know how to uh, work in a in, in an international environment. Um, so that that's the first point. And the second point is that um, I see Switzerland a bit as as a magnet in the um, in the um, in, in the European. Uh, 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 labor market, which means that we have also the ability to attract talents, not only for those 8 million inhabitants you were mentioning, but also from, uh, from, from other locations. And perhaps just one uh, thing, which, um, which is the, the conclusion of that, is that the, um, if we look at the, the Global Talent Competitiveness Index, uh, which is the one from INSEAD, certainly the, the, uh, the reference one in terms of, uh, of index, we didn't is ranked as first uh, country um, in terms of uh, talent competitiveness. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. This, um, anybody else want to add something or the size yeah. of, yeah, Monica, thank you. I would, one, one of the things that I can say is that uh, Switzerland is certainly a place where a lot of my clients, when they are looking at the location and it becomes known within their companies, people within the organization proactively reach out to the project team and say, oh, by the way, if you need anyone to go to Switzerland, I would be happy to move there. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about the local talent. It's also about choosing a place where people who are already in your organization would be happy to move to and, and stay there and be happy there. Mm -hmm. Monica, I, th um, I think when you think about sort of future of work and, and areas of sort of, in America, you hear a lot about the great resignation, uh, people being happy, uh, people being kind, uh, that actually manifests itself so powerfully within organizations. And in the six months that I've been living uh, in Switzerland now, it's, it's completely um, just everyday normality to see people go out of their way to want to help. Uh, to have a natural curiosity uh, and to make a connection. So I think that's a very powerful uh, factor, you know, when you're looking at, well, surely we want to be based where people have the best quality of life. And, and that in turn makes it far, far easier to attract the best talent. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. The other thing I think that I would like to mention is, the fact that Switzerland is is very small in terms of land, right? I was looking at this. It's the size of, I think, Massachusetts and Vermont about, right? I mean, in terms of land, but it's extremely dense in terms of uh, economic uh, um, activity. Uh, it, it's it's uh, densely uh, um, uh, populated and, and, and uh, a lot of uh, concentration. And actually within uh, the region, there are 850 multinationals have decided to put their global headquarters in that small region. And companies like HP, Logitech, Cisco, Electronic Arts, Nestle, of course, is very well known. And then the Swatch Group or Schindler or Oracle. I mean, very, very, you know, worldwide um, uh, known names. So um, that's something that I think is important to know. And uh, the fact that everybody is also very well connected. And it's not difficult to, once you know someone, you know, they, it's, it's easy to network. Um, the second point that maybe our audience would like to know more about is what are the main sectors and industries that drive the Swiss economy? How, how to describe this in a, in a, in a, in a, quick, uh, a quick paragraph, I would say. Well, I think um, in Switzerland, we have a bit of everything, huh? but we're fundamentally, I think, really strong in engineering. Mm -hmm. And so you will find a whole lot of engineering of all sorts going on. You will find um, also a lot of consumer goods companies that are there, luxury companies, um, and then anything that rotates around that. Mm -hmm. um, we, we do have a wealth of actually, I would say Swiss jewels that produce items that go into products like for instance the iPhone or you know the 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 the, the machine that helps you pull up the the um, windows in a car 
Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. like the this. components for the automotive components industry. For the car. Yeah. yeah, so there are a lot of things, you know, companies that produce these pieces, a lot of technology mm -hmm. and, uh, and engineering really happening on the one hand side. On the other hand side, we obviously have pharma mm -hmm. um, as well, the whole financial sector and uh, crypto as well. Mm -hmm. And then last uh, but not least, we have the whole headquarters that actually cover any kind of industry. That it's, it's really more the headquarters model uh, that you would have the base for expanding internationally, mm -hmm. right? And uh, whether whether it's in actually within Europe or um, other locations, uh, Middle East, Africa, even Asia, sometimes it's done from here. That's right. That's right. I noticed that it's, it's a hub to cover the Middle East and uh, and and uh, and uh, Northern uh, Africa. Yes. Um, I think one, one other thing to note is that Switzerland is famous for being the land of innovation. <clears throat> it's the number, it, it has the number one uh, number of patent registrations per capita, and that's been uh, true for a number of years. And, um, and the startup uh, scene also is very active. It, it's incredibly uh, vibrant. Lately, um, Switzerland has more than 50,000 startups and 400 come in every, new, new ones come every year. And so there are projects like the Blue Brain Project at TPFL, which is one of the engineering schools in uh, Lausanne, that builds uh, and reconstructs uh, uh, mouse, the mouse brain, which is incredible, right? Or you can think of Unicorn, like Sophia Genetics, that does uh, AI technology to analyze genetic information. Um, so extremely sophisticated, right? Our onward medical that helps people with spine injuries walk again with implants. Medtech is also a great se sector. I actually listened recently to a company called Biped, a Swiss company that presented at Stanford University. And it's, it's a wearable to put around your neck that's gonna tell people who are blind uh, how to navigate uh, safely the, and, and walk without, uh, uh, with, with information about, um, about the, their path. It's it's quite uh, quite impressive, using AI. Um, so innovation, yes. Yeah, no. I would say, just generally speaking, I think um, um, th there's an image of Switzerland which is uh, chocolate and uh, and private banks, uh, but it's way watches. it goes it, and, and watches. It goes way beyond that. Uh, it goes way beyond because, um, uh, as Monica was saying, I mean, it's just uh, amazing when you look at the expertise of each of those uh, small companies at uh, bio in the in biotech world, as you were mentioning, Marjorie, but uh, in a lot of uh, very technical or IT related fields or crypto, as you were mentioning, mm -hmm. um, there's yeah, there's there's a strong expertise in in a lot of different fields, um, and uh, and and a lot of those companies are are really serving uh, clients everywhere. I mean, not only in Switzerland for sure, but even at at global level. So that that's uh, really something to. To, to keep in mind in, in Sweden, there's really this, uh, this innovation uh, mindset. And as you were uh, you were talking about EPFL, um, there's uh, so this is uh, one of the universities where um, uh, several Nobel prizes have uh, also been uh, educated. So it's something. I mean, this is something which uh, is also um, recognized by the um, by the, by the um, academic community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So actually, D Derek, I'd like to hear from you. Why did you choose Switzerland? Why? I mean, knowing all this, I guess what made you come and uh, to Switzerland and, and tell us, please, a, li a little bit more about my share. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And it's just great to be with everyone and have a chance to share some of my experiences in evaluating, you know, where to to go in Europe and and landing on Switzerland. Um, just as background, Marsha uh, is a product-based branding company. We're, we're global uh, on four continents. Um, and uh, as a business, we use data and academic research to uh, really try to create uh, highly effective products that are sourced responsibly. Some examples are sort of right behind me. But we're actually using that data and academic research to try to shift consumer behavior. Um, uh, we are, as a business, a certified B Corporation, and many of your audience may have heard of the B Corp movement. It is now well over 4,000 businesses globally. 
And I think one of the real attractions to Switzerland was this sort of um, incubation um, culture. Uh, and so using EPFL as an example, we met through an organization, and this is gosh, six years ago, uh, six years ago, an organization called Kytro uh, that was incubated out of EPFL to tackle food waste. And you might be thinking, well, what's a product-based branding company that's producing gear? In, why is, would we be interested in food waste? Well, the reality is, is that a large number of our customers who are in the travel industry, cruise lines, hotels, they waste a lot of food. And so we became part of that incubation and actually invested in, in Kytro to help us be uh, an encourager of change uh, within, within businesses. Now, in that first uh, gathering, we had academics, we had startups, we had um, go uh, government uh, representatives, we had captains of industry, um, and this sort of, uh, and thought leaders, and this, this sort of group just sort of melded together and came out with really brilliant ideas that you just wouldn't hear anywhere else. And I know in our own business, a number of things that we do in our business have happened because of this natural collaboration that occurs in Switzerland. And it happens again and again and again. And so put aside what I think of a no brain of things like the quality of life, the crossroads to Europe, the ability to see customers wherever they are by train instead of having to get on a plane, even going to Paris or Milan. Um, it's this natural collaboration. Uh, and I believe this is deeply linked to happiness and happiness in the workplace. And I think when we think about future of work, that becomes very important to be looking at you know, things like stakeholder governance and Switzerland, I think, is really well placed for those conversations and those learnings. Very nice. Thank you very much. I, that's great. Great to hear. But then there is there is something that maybe is on people's mind and we don't talk about it enough, but it's maybe the elephant in the room is the fact that Switzerland is often labeled as expensive, right? It's expensive in Switzerland. Now, that, can, can, can we give some... Uh, so, some, some, uh, you know, some sense about this. I mean, Monica, I know you, you have some, some, something to say about this. Salaries yeah, well, and... I think if you look just at the headline, just the salary, the, the number, right? Yeah. It, it is higher, right? There's nothing, nothing to say about that. Um, what we can say though is once we look at the fully loaded costs, which include social security um, and any other related costs, as well as the number of days worked. Um, overall, you can see that there is, Switzerland is not really expensive, right? It is clear though, I mean, if you look at low level routine type functions, right then it might not make sense you might not look at switzerland for that however the type of functions that are high value added functions mm -hmm. um, those are totally competitive mm -hmm. once you really look at the overall package and for some functions there is really actually no difference whatsoever mm -hmm. and i think overall so between social security and personal income taxes compared to other locations. It's clearly um, competitive and, and overall the cost is not that daunting anymore, but it's very, it's very comparable and sometimes frankly lower. Mm -hmm. JB, you wanted to add something to this, right? <laughs> Yes, um, I'm, um, because uh, indeed the, the exactly what uh, what Monica was saying. If you, if you look just at the salaries, they, they will be they will be higher. And if you look at what um, the talents are looking uh, in Switzerland, the Swiss talents in terms of um, what we call EVP criteria, so what they are looking when deciding to 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 leave for another company or to stay uh, at their current employer. Um, uh, Compensation um, is only ranked at the fifth criteria, while it's the it's the third in uh, in Germany, it's the second in the UK, it's the first in the US, and I think that actually it's it's uh, a kind of um, of of virtuous cycle because um, uh, it means that 
they, um, I mean, the, uh, having a good salary, having, having a decent salary, is something which is granted. Um, it's part of the culture. Um, so you won't change for a hundred uh, dollars. Uh, you, you won't look for another job just based on this uh, on this criteria. So um, it means that you will be looking for the the culture of your company. How how how. Do I belong to uh, to the company culture? Am I challenging my daily work? Uh, am I inspired my, by my leader? And finally, you are, you have uh, something which is way more on the long term, I would say. Um, and the relationship, um, as also between the employer and the employee, um, is is also on a, on another um, uh, on another level. So th these are also hidden costs, you know, when you have people leaving and leaving and leaving. Um, it's it's something which has a, which has a, which has an impact, and uh, for me, it's also uh, what I was mentioning before: the, this virtuosity of uh, of having good salaries um, for uh, for having also uh, people happy in their job on that. Right, right. So I know retention was, of course, the next topic we wanted to touch on, and this is big because I, you know, it's in Silicon Valley that the turnover or the attrition, as you call it, is like is really very strong. The market is extremely fluid here and people uh, stay on average. Uh, I think at Google, they stay about three years. Um, at Apple, they stay about nine months. Uh, some startups, they stay even, I mean, these are median median time of people staying in the job. It's crazy. People hop from job to job and, and it's very difficult to keep people. So uh, I know, I think I, in Switzerland, it's, it's slightly, um, <laughs> these are different numbers, right? I mean, people uh, stay in their job for for decades, probably on average, on median. Yeah. Yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, um, I think that um, the, the there's certainly a, a different uh, um, way of uh, of uh, projecting yourself in, in in your job, also because uh, the criteria of uh, of salary is not the first one, and uh, mm -hmm. um, and I think this is really one of the of the main reason. Well, there's a lot of other good reasons why uh, to stay in a, in in a job, but uh, this element really um, plays uh, on our favor, I would say. So yeah, definitely tenure is uh, is, um, is is uh, more uh, is longer um, in Switzerland uh, than um, than than in the US. Yeah. And I read. A... Yeah, sorry, Derek. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just—I was just going to say that uh, I spent 30 years um, on the west coast of America, and uh, you know, when we think about uh, the most common conversations we have with their clients, our clients—they inevitably centered around finding good people because the turnover was just so high. And one of the things that only really struck me after a few months in Switzerland was also the turnover of our clients, um, that it was just very frequent that we would be forging a new relationship because the CMO, it's a new CMO, uh, the, the C-suite is just continually changing. And what struck me here is that people, because they're happy in their work and they're paid, uh, I think, fair money, good money for their work, um, uh, they align themselves much more closely about establishing where do my talents really lie uh, and how do I make sure that I'm actually activating those talents in a culture, uh, a values aligned culture? Um, and I think there's some elements to the Swiss system that I know we're going to get to a little bit later on that really tap into that. And I would argue, you know, the cost savings, you know, the commercial benefits from this far, far, far outweigh any sort of initial budgetary, uh, you know, how the numbers pencil out. There was something that also uh, attracted Americans, and that's that's actually uh, called the vocational training and apprenticeship in Switzerland. And this has received uh, quite, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it was front page news for uh, several times. Even it, it has a bipartisan consensus between the Obama administration and the Trump administration. They came to Switzerland to study how this could work, and, and they're trying to bring it over here. So, um, can you give us some some details about this uh, the, the, this uh, apprenticeship system in in Switzerland that works so well? Monica, maybe, or JB, or yeah, well, I can take that. Um, I think about two thirds of um, 
the population in Switzerland has gone through vocational training. Um, one third went to college as we think about college, university, mm -hmm. right? Um, but what is important to consider, the people who go through vocational training and the type of vocational training that we have here um, is, is uh, very broad, okay? So for instance, if you want to become an accountant, you don't go to university. You actually go through vocational training and you work at the same time as you're going through school and really learn hands-on accounting. Right. So when they come out of their training, they are proper accountants with practical experience at the age of 20. Right. Because they start their vocational training, their apprenticeships when they're 16. Mm -hmm. um, so this is really a, an important difference. And so when you are looking for people, it is actually important to understand this difference um because if you're saying uh we're looking for an accountant let's just say that went to university well you will not find an accountant that went to university not really right although you could say the educational level is at university level it's just not called university because you are supposed to work at the same time as you are studying and being learned the practical elements as well of your trade or business that you are studying. So um, that is really important for whoever is looking for people to bear in mind, um, not to close the opportunities by saying, we're just looking for people who went to college um, because you might have just equivalent or potentially even better education in relation to that particular topic by people who just you know, went through a, an alternative educational path. Uh, that that's really uh, important. What uh, what Monica was just saying in terms of uh, um, the, the type of um, people you are looking. And I mean, if you are open minded enough, if you don't put any limit in terms of um, education's background, uh, this is really one of the the key to uh, to recruit the best people here in Switzerland. Um, and and this is I think what also in the is in the mindset of uh, of Swiss entrepreneurs is not to. Uh, um, to say, okay, I, I have this profile in mind, I won't uh, change my mind and I will recruit this person because uh, this is the only option I, I take. Um, and really, this is uh, what makes the, um, the, the beauty of, of that. I just one example is the, that the, the ex-CEO of, of UBS, uh, who has been CEO for, uh, for 10 or 15 years of UBS, um, uh, did a vocational tra uh, training. I mean, he started uh, his banking apprenticeship, he grew up, um, which also means that you're not blocked in your career because you started uh, from, the, um, uh, from the ground. So uh, th there are plenty of other examples uh, in, in organizations uh, like this. So, um, definitely a, a great, uh, great thing. It's not a secret recipe that Switzerland uh, is, uh, is uh, keeping for itself and not sharing with uh, our American friends. But it's, it's a good example, JB, of how um, this sort of natural, natural collaboration forms, because I remember it was, I think, my first meeting with GGBA in Los Angeles. And uh, I learned about the vocational uh, apprenticeship program and my in instinctive reaction was, boy, do we need that in America? Because imagine the difference to America's workforce if, if people went through their teens and then had that ability to actually align with defining their interests, their passion and what they're really good at and then proving that that's what they want to do. And so in Switzerland, uh, most people who I've interacted with went through vocational training and it's very rare that you hear them say, oh, and I hated what I did because the support system was in place to actually carry both, both in the education system, uh, in the governance, uh, government system that, that helps fund, but also in private enterprise as well. Um, and the schools just make it work and one of the things i hope to do is be able to lift some of the learnings that that we will have in our business and and bring this back to los angeles because there are some real significant challenges for equity in the workplace and how you get people 
you know, who perhaps don't have such a fortunate start in life to get on the right track. And I think vocational training really, really provides that opportunity. And what incredible workers you end up with. Okay, so no secret, but uh, a recipe that works. And and I I agree. So then are there some jobs that are dif more difficult to to source in, in Switzerland? Then I mean, are, we, we are hearing about a high sophisticated uh, knowledge intensive. Uh, what about? Well, I, I, um, I'll, I'll take that uh, only uh, through the angle of uh, the jobs we are covering uh, at Michael Page, uh, which are uh, mainly, uh, uh, let's say, blue colors position, if, if I may. Um, uh, as uh, other Western economies, uh, the, the, there's uh, difficulty to recruit engineers, to recruit uh, IT roles, because the demand is, uh, the, the demand is so important um, that uh, we need to uh, um, to cope with, and um, we have some jobs like uh, some SAP consultants, where we know that there's 11 times more jobs available than talents in the market. So, I mean, you, you th th there's uh, there's a gap here, and and uh, but the question is, I would say more uh, around the uh, how to 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 tackle such a challenge, and um, and perhaps it's even linked to what we were just saying before to um, to vocational tra training. But I think there's also an appetite for for upskilling uh, or for reskilling um, uh, within Swiss organization and Swiss uh, talents are uh, eager to uh, to take um, to take uh, further education to take further training. Um, I, I think with uh, we ran a survey last year and uh, it was. Uh, a bit more than two thirds of the people we have interviewed in Switzerland uh, that had um, uh, a, a reskilling over the last 12 months, uh, like a, a program uh, within the organization, or uh, wow. that they took personally to 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 reskill or, or upskill. So, one of the the, the main uh, asset that we have is that if we don't find the the, the talents, uh, we can also uh, upgrades uh, everyone to 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 reach their their potential yeah and and i think just as a as a remark that it would be um too limited to say that you can only um recruit in switzerland right basically when you do have your company here your recruitment playground is at least you know the whole of europe right and and even beyond that um a lot of my clients recruit globally they receive cvs from around the world of people who are interested to work in switzerland with those organizations um so i think you know there is a global labor shortage anyhow shortage of talent of of, of specialist knowledge so obviously it's not different but i would say at least you do have a very big pond to go and fish in. Very true. And so I'm I, I'm hearing that also from some of, of our clients that say, OK, I'm going to go to Switzerland, but wait, uh, you're not part of the EU. How can I get these people over? So uh, isn't that uh, a simple answer, Monica? Then if they are an EU citizen, they can come and work. Very, there. very simple. If you're a EU citizen, um it's very easy to get a work permit so there is no restrictions in terms of numbers um and and it's it's, it's really simple smooth. process smooth sailing yes okay um very nice then i would like to talk about uh, go back to you know how easy is it to do business in switzerland and maybe one obvious uh, big one is the, the language. I mean, so English is not part of the four official languages. Um, and, and Derek, how do you manage? Uh, do, you, do you speak German, French, Italian, and uh, Swiss German? Uh, petit peu de français, <laughs> and, uh, uh, my, my German has uh, got a long, long way to go. Much I think, better today. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I think, honestly, the sort of business language in Switzerland is, is English. Um, and so if you are from an English speaking country or you speak through English, you are not going to find any issues in terms of communicating in Switzerland. So 
Uh, I have schoolboy French. Um, in June, in preparation, I started having, you know, weekly studies and my French is slowly improving because I've made it a personal desire to try to integrate with the language. I don't need to do that. The majority of people that I know, and I include customer, customers in this, uh, where they've bought people in from other countries, uh, they offer classes, but not everybody's taking the classes because they find they don't need to. So it becomes that sort of personal choice. Uh, I will say that the Swiss love it when you attempt wherever you happen to be their language. And it's typically about one or two sentences and they, they, they decide to rescue you and, and move into uh, to English. So I, I would say from a business point of view, it's so easy. It's just not even worth worrying about. And then from a personal point of view, it's been fun. And um, I have to say that I've, I've gained more confidence myself for uh, being comfortable making mistakes. Nobody's made me feel bad at all. And so um, it opens up a whole avenue of new excitement and relationships because um, there is a natural curiosity in Switzerland. Switzerland itself has got such a fascinating history. And I think certainly I had no clue about it until you know I started sort of getting into the preparation and think, gosh, why wouldn't you want to dive in to the culture a little bit more? Um, and everything is just like a stone's throw away because the transportation system here is, is, is so, so easy. So I, I would just urge everyone not to even think about the language as being a challenge uh, and to know that, for example, uh, JB, Monica, you know, that their, their natural tongue will be French. And if they're speaking in, in uh, uh, you know, uh, in German speaking Switzerland, they're probably speaking English. <laughs> is that right, guys? Actually, I do speak Swiss, which is Swiss German, German, French, Italian. Oh, you got English. it all. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have enough fingers on your on your hand. <laughs> but I uh, agree, uh, Derek. I'll, I'll I'll just do it in in English. I'll do the same than you do in French, uh, starting in German, and they they will rescue me as well mm -hmm. uh, in uh, in uh, in English. So this is exactly uh, exactly that, and perhaps to. Uh, to to connect with the the question before um, um, uh, when we were talking about the European Union, actually I think it's uh, even certainly one of the of the European countries where you would have uh, less difficulties to find English speakers, um, and this is really one of the stronger assets uh, is that everywhere uh, everyone is, uh, uh, is is speaking uh, not a perfect english uh, as you see but uh, at least an english that can uh, allow uh, everyone to uh, to interact to make business to um so yeah it's it's really something easy i would say definitely an international workforce monica initially talked about the key sector in the in switzerland being uh, biotech pharma and chemicals, uh, th that industry, I think about half of the workers, a little less than half of the workers are foreigner. I mean, they are come from abroad in that sector. It's incredible. So probably English definitely is the fifth official language of Switzerland. Um, great. Uh, let's move on to another topic. Um, let's say that you have found the talent that you were looking for in Switzerland, you're hiring. Actually, this is happening right now with one of our clients. They've hired their first key hire, very uh, difficult person to find in deep tech and uh, and uh, quantum computing. And, and so what do, what is, I mean, can they hire the person, of course, easily? And, and what, it, what does it take to create an entity? Do they need an entity, Monica? How, how, how can they structure that and be compliant? Right, so whether or not you need an entity all depends on who you are finding, okay? But um, let's say you have found someone who is not a Swiss person and um, who would not go, would not accept to go one of the alternative routes, okay? So yes, you do create either a subsidiary in Switzerland. Uh, normally we would use for US groups, uh, the legal form of an SARL, um, which is the equivalent of an L US LLC. Um, this is due to US reasons that there is a 
a, a preference for that. Um, it's easy to, to set up, can be done relatively quickly. I would say the most difficult piece are more governance pieces where you need to think about who do you want to be on your board? Um, you know, what are they allowed to do in terms of the, the people who have signatory powers as well? And then uh, opening a, a bank account um, in order for to, 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 to pay the share capital basically of the company. This can take a while, right? Um, and so it's otherwise, I think it's um, smooth sailing. An alternative to that is opening up a branch um, uh, that is also then registered in what we call the register of, of commerce. So it's, it's almost like a subsidiary, but it is not a separate legal entity. So some companies prefer that as well. Um, again, not super complicated, but it just requires a certain number of information, a certain amount of information that will have to be provided and, and um, that will need to be done, you know, signed by notary public and with an apostille as the case may be. So, right. Actually, um, they can even do that remotely, right, Monica? I've heard companies that set up shop without having... Uh, I mean, in terms of the executives. Well, it, it, well, yeah, you can do it, but you need to have someone locally who will actually right. go and take care of some things. Yes, that's right. So Mar Marjorie, we, we set up as a SA or an AG, which is a limited liability company. Yeah. And my initial beliefs, um, and this kind of is connected to when we established our business in America 30 years ago, was that I would have to do a tremendous amount of legwork and discovery myself. Um, and, and I just want to sort of hats off to GGBA and in our case, the Innovo team uh, for the Canton of Vaux mm -hmm. um, really guided us through the whole process, including establishing the business before I was even over here. Um, and, um, you know, having our bank accounts uh, organized, which, you know, when you speak to other people in America, they'll, they'll say things like, oh, that's, that's really hard to do. And there was a process to follow, but it's actually quite a simple process. And um, the one thing that I absolutely love and, and cherish about Switzerland, um, and it was my accountant who taught me this, and that was in Switzerland, you are trusted until you're not. And that permeates every aspect of society. So for example, if you are um, going to rent something, uh, like I rented a garage the other day, um, there was no bill to pay. Uh, you know, a contract was signed and an invoice would be sent to be paid subsequently. And this happens for things like online ordering. And this is, if you've lived in America a while. <laughs> it's a little different. <laughs> alien, completely alien. 20 pages of signatures here, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before you do anything. Yeah, because of liability. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so they, 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 they trust you. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah, they, they make it easy, it's, right? It's, it's, I look at it as it's how our business should be done. It's, mm -hmm. it's you know, uh, just trust is first and foremost. And Friendly. I think that's a powerful value that... Uh, is often, you know, missing because of legal liabilities, and uh, it's not been our experience in Switzerland. And and it makes things quicker. I mean, uh, if we look at the the employment um, uh, law and uh, the 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 way people are also uh, um, uh, interacting between employer and employees uh, because of this trust. Um, I think you can hire someone in a quicker way because you don't have to go through a, a very very long uh, process in terms of uh, onboarding. Uh, I mean, in, in terms of the paperwork, I would say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's much easier if uh, we look at uh, temporary work, for example, or but even for permanent contracts, um, it's it's really straightforward. Uh, and uh, you you agree between uh, between uh, human beings in uh, in what uh, what set the scene, and uh, and then you can uh, you can uh, quickly. Uh, start to work and that's something really uh, uh, which helps a lot I would say in terms of efficiency. Right and is that related to the size of the country and the fact that it's organized by Canton and then you have access to the the local authorities I, I guess faster than, than the rest of, of maybe I mean other neighboring countries there's le less red tape I believe in Switzerland don't you agree I mean maybe Derek was that ex your experience? Very much so uh, I um 
I had to produce a document yesterday that showed that there were no legal claims against us. Um, and I could choose to do it online. I actually chose to go into our communal office and uh, it was mailed out yesterday and this morning it arrived. It, it just, everything is so efficient. It's, it's, it's really remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why things are, 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 are I think um, we, we, we sort of, uh, in America, I tend to look at how do we protect ourselves from every possibility that can happen. And I think particularly in regards to employment law, and fundamentally, these things actually get in the way of creating, you know, systemic change in the workforce that allows sort of more fair and equitable employment practices. Mm -hmm. I don't have the number, but I'm going to be very confident to say that whether you're a man or a woman in Switzerland, your salary, um, you know, you're getting paid for the job, not for the gender that you are. Uh, that's a very powerful, just one of many examples, um, example of, of, of how it should be. Um, and it's not like that in America in many cases. Right, that, actually that's something we, we haven't touched on, the labor laws in Switzerland. How different or how similar are they to maybe the US system? Monica, did you have? Well, I mean, this is one of the things that we discuss with, with uh, the clients who wish to set up shop in Switzerland, set up a hub mm -hmm. for any kind of presence. And I would say Swiss law is as close as it can get to US type environments um, without being totally there. But it's very, it's very liberal in the sense that, for instance, we don't have severance pay. Right. So the maximum, if you if you decide to separate from an employee, um, legally speaking, the maximum notice period is three months. And then if you if you decide something else, um, then this is on you, <laughs> I would say. Right. So it's then between the parties they can negotiate, they can negotiate something else. But legally speaking, that's the that's the amount that you have. And so I think overall, this is also one of the reasons why a lot of my clients have chosen to come to Switzerland, because it is a great location in the heart of Europe, because you do have access to great talent, uh, because of the labor laws um, as well, which, which are a I would say for a lot of our clients, a refreshing differentiator as to other locations. And then ultimately of a very competitive, I would say, rest of the environment, including um, corporate and, and personal income taxes. Oh, that's right. Taxes. I guess maybe we want to touch that a little bit. I mean, uh, uh, what are what are the Swiss company tax rates and, and how how do they do they work in in uh, Briefly, do you want to give some some color? Well, to okay. That? So the ordinary tax rates are between let's say twelve and approximately twenty one percent, depending on where you're going to in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Most of the cantons are between twelve and fifteen percent, mm -hmm. let's say. Uh, yeah. um, and that um, actually falls right in line with the new global projects uh, for very large multinationals, so that have. Uh, in excess of 750 million of, of revenue. Um, there will be a minimum tax rate of 15%. Mm -hmm. But I think otherwise, if you are below that threshold, you still can take advantage of, um, of, of the, let's say, the relatively lower tax rates that you, that you can get in Switzerland. And then we do have some special uh, regimes like uh, patent boxes, if you do have patent and the patents have been developed by people who are located in Switzerland, R&D super deductions, these types of things mm -hmm. are all available here as well. So if anyone has any questions in relation to your very specific case, more than happy to have a call with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, very nice. <clears throat> yeah, we, we talked about Switzerland as a country of innovation and, and uh, Actually, it ranks pretty high in terms of the the, the amount that's invested in R and D. Uh, as uh, you know, it's about three point four percent of the GDP that's invested in R and D, and only two countries do more than that. And one is Korea, the other is Israel. 
So it's it's a, it's a pretty uh, impressive number for, I mean, small countries, right? So then they, they invest, that's what they, they rely on, innovation. Um, very good. So thank you so much for all this information. I think, um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I think there is some, I don't know, there's some, someone that raised the hand, but I don't, I, if you have some questions, you can uh, ask them in the chat. And um, I, is there anything else that you guys would like to add or did we uh, uh, cover everything? I, I think uh, definitely uh, remote work is here to stay and um, companies, uh, could, uh, you know, are welcome to look at the potential in Switzerland. I don't think Switzerland is for everyone. I think we all agree on that. It's maybe not uh, the right fit for every company, but I hope that today we gave some information about, you know, beyond the chocolate, the watches and the, the cheese, about what exactly uh, Switzerland is about. And, um, and I think uh, we've heard about, you know, being a desirable location, having uh, liberal uh, labor laws, uh, being able to reskill, uh, highly qualified functions and vocational training. So it was very informative. Thank you very much, every one of you. I am so grateful to your, for your time and your participation. So I would like to wrap this up. I think we are, we've, uh, we've done this for an hour. So I want to respect time for everybody. Have a great Easter, a great Passover. And uh, we'll be back in touch. Uh, you can reach out to us anytime. Thank you. Thanks a lot. See you. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.